just to get one thing right before you get overexcited with questions, we did think we'd begin with questions and then we thought we wouldn't. Um, that's a sign of what an organic conversation this is going to be. We do want to have questions, don't we? And we do want to hear what you think because you must have strong responses to what you've just seen. But we thought we would say a few things first. Um, we're going to be in, in free conversation. We don't have a chairman. We're not interviewing each other, but we're going to talk to each other. Um, May I say I thought that was an admirably clear description of the problem. Uh, how frustrating it is, though, that w at, the, 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 at the end of this film, we still feel we have a problem. This is a film that could have been made before the inquiry. It's a bit of a shock to see so many people so frustrated and so much feeling that they were, that were as, as the last speaker said, abandoned after the inquiry. And that's part of the problem. In a way, we could have a two-part conversation, couldn't we, about what the problem was and what the, and what the inquiry addressed. And then the fact of the inquiry itself, which I, th in you, I think, as you say, f only manifests the problem even more. I, uh, I'm quite shocked by, um, by the giving of a, of, a, of a peerage to Chakrabarti. I'm shocked by the speed of it. Um, I'm shocked by what that, what that suggested about, about Corbyn. I felt that was Corbyn just saying to, the, to, to, to all those of us who complained that that's what you, what you do. <laughs> Whatever you feel about people's response to something that you've done, at least you make a pretense of listening. And if, people, and if people do say that they think something has been inadequately dealt with, you don't there and then within how, what was the period between the finishing of the report and, and her getting of a night so quickly. I'm surprised he even waited for her to finish. So that for me, is a, that for me was an alarming sign. But just before we get talking, um, <clears throat> David, as, as is clear, comes from the left. I don't come from the left, which doesn't mean I come from the right. I don't come from anywhere, really. I am a writer um, and rather grandly think of myself as above the fray uh, as a writer. I came into the whole business of thinking about anti-Zionism versus, versus anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism quite late, really. And I came into it not so much as a Jew, but, but as a writer, as a consequence of my writing um, for 20 years for The Independent, uh, an experience I enjoyed. But while I was working on The Independent, I did come across, um, in, a, in a daily fashion, certainly in a weekly fashion, um, examples of the sorts of, of the sorts of elision of anti of anti Zionism and anti Semitism that had been talked about. And more and more I thought, well there is a problem here. For me, not so much of, of political allegiance, but of but of language. Something stank in the poetry of it for me. Let me just say too that I did submit to this um, inquiry. I wasn't going to, I thought there was no point. I had not been an admirer of, at all of Chakrabarti. In fact, I'd been fairly rude to her in the course of my 20 years as a columnist and I'd not been in the slightest bit an admirer of, of, um, of Corbyn. But then I hadn't been an admirer of anybody very much as a, as a columnist, that was my style. But I wrote a piece for, I was commissioned by the Catholic Herald to write a piece, the Catholic Herald, to write a cover story for them about anti-Semitism. And I let them have it with both barrels and they took it and then they say that they, and they said that they liked it. And it was about the problem of anti-Semitism within the church, not the Labour Party, but something that precedes even the Labour Party. And that was the Catholic Church. I think it was Mark Gardner who wrote, wrote to me and said, I like that piece, why don't you submit it? And I said, why would I do that? And he said, well, it's worth a go. I submitted it. Um, there's, as many people felt, um, there was no sign that, that the Chakrabarti Commission, the Chakrabarti Inquiry, had read a word that they'd written. I certainly don't feel she'd read a word that I'd written, because one of my main points really was that we will never feel convinced that the problem of anti-Semitism is being dealt with if the people dealing with it offered cannot talk about anti-Semitism without at the same time saying all racism. I don't know whether you've noticed, but the Corbyn has never yet said anti-Semitism without also saying all racism, as though he has to apologize for everybody else before he can apologize for anti-Semitism. And that particularly bothered me. I don't know how you feel about this from your point of view, so but I put it to you even as a question. That particularly bothered me because it seems to me that anti-Semitism actually is a racism separate from other racisms. Not because we're more important people, not because we have suffered more, but because the thing goes so much deeper in the psyche of the English and indeed of the Western world. 
precisely because it goes all back, all the way back to Jesus Christ, precisely because there is a medieval, because we have the medieval views of Jews, and precisely because some of those blood libels still crop up in, in, in modern discourse, one has to say that it's a different, it's, it's different in, if not different in essentially in nature, it's different in extent and it's different in history. Do you think that's right? I think, I think one can argue it both ways. I think in, in the Labour Party and in what was that beautiful graphic, My World, um, it's different because it's the only form of bigotry or racism which is okay. Or it's the only form of bigotry or racism which people cannot recognise. So, you know, I think in today's Labour Party it really is. Uh, so it's different in that sense. I think, yes, there are specificities of, of, of anti-Semitism, but I also think I'm actually fairly happy if it's treated as a racism amongst other racisms, and I think it should be. There are arguments on both sides, but the difference is that um, this is the one that's a problem particularly on the left at the moment. And do I you think. feel, the minute Corbyn says, and I'm sure in writing, I'm right in saying he always says it, we, we do not, we do not, we will not tolerate anti-Semitism yep. or any racism yep. in our party. Are you not made uncomfortable by that or any rate? Do you Absolutely. not feel that's a dilution? Well, what he's unable to do when he denounces anti-Semitism is to prove to us that he understands what we're talking about. Yeah? So we raise the issue, you know, your 30-year career... Um, you know, going to Gaza to hang out with Hezbollah and your political support for, sorry, with Hamas and your political support for, for Hezbollah and the rest of it, and your support for the boycott. We raise all these issues, and Corbyn says, well, um, I'm against anti-Semitism, and I, you know, if I see it anywhere, I hate it, and I'll expel you from the party. So he, what he refuses to do is to reassure us that he understands what it is. And there's a reason for that, of course, which is that he doesn't, understand what it is, or he has a very different understanding to that which, which I suspect most people in this room have. Um, and it's certainly a different understanding to how uh, racism or uh, sexism or homophobia is usually thought of on the left. Usually, actually not always. But um, So that's what I think. I think it's a signal of a refusal to recognize. So how, I mean, I ask you now as a, as a you're the, you, you, I mean, you're, you're, you're a lefty, you, uh, <laughs> as you say. How do you explain that? How do you explain that very specific difficulty the Labour Party has with this specific racism? Yeah, well, there's three things we know about this specific form of racism, of anti-Semitism. Um, one is that it's carried by people who genuinely think that they oppose anti-Semitism. So it's carried by people who have no self-consciousness about it. And, and, you, and they're honourable in this, you believe? I think they, in, they honestly believe they are against anti-Semitism? I think in general okay. they okay. do honest. Yes, okay. absolutely. Um, that's why they're so angry with us. That's why, that's why when you raise an issue of anti-Semitism, they look inside their own head and they say, is there any hatred of Jews there in my own head? And that, so for a sociologist, it's great because usually you have to look out at the world. You have to ask people, look at people, look at discourse. But these guys, they don't need to do that. They just need to look into their own head. Do I hate Jews? No, of course I don't. So I'm anti-fascist. So they find innocence when they look within. They find, absolutely. And it's a violation of every kind of methodological principle, which is that you look out at the world and, and you, you try and create some kind of method and the rest of it. But no, this is look at myself, not guilty. And then once you're not guilty, then we have to say, well, why are all these people saying that we're guilty? Why are they raising all this issue? And then the answer is going to be because they're up to something. So, and, this, and, this is your, and, and this is where the Livingston formulation comes in. Yeah. This it's funny because I thought I invented Livingston formulation. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. I don't want to fight you over it. <laughs> I am older than you, and I probably was saying it while you were still at school. <laughs> But you're, but you're happy. No, I'm happy for you to have it. Uh, when you, if it's if it's that important to you, <laughs> when I see the source, Howard. <laughs> um, I don't do sources. <laughs> yes. Um, so that's the, the this. It was Dave Rich's phrase actually that that ah. contemporary. No, not that. Oh, <laughs> that's <right>. mine. <laughs> that contemporary anti-Semitism is when um, the Jews are always suspected of being up to something. And this is the way it works. This is the way we've experienced it for many years in our trade union and in the Labour Party and other places, that, that when you raise the issue of anti-Semitism, there's an assumption that you're up to something, that you're speaking in bad faith, 
And actually, for many Jews who speak, or not only Jews, of course, but many non-Jews too who understand the issue and see it and raise it, they're treated as people who are doing so dishonestly. And isn't this an anti-Semitism in itself? Because I've always mm. felt that this particular... I don't know how many times I've begun an article which goes, I do not think it is anti-Semitic to be critical of Israel. I am, I am a bit perturbed by whenever you see the word Israel, you have to have critical of, as though the two things, you know, you can ever talk about Israel mm. without being... We've all got to be critical of Israel. None of us can say, well, I'm not really interested in this. We're all critical of yep. it, but leave that aside. This idea that, the, this idea that no matter how many times you say, look, I perfectly understand that can be critical of, you can be a critic of Israel, but not necessarily anti-Semitic, they won't accept it. They won't accept They just assume that you always, that you're always trying to smear them, is the word. Yep. To, to silence them. Is this not itself a form of anti-Semitism? Um, and an inability to trust the goodwill and the motives of Jews, is that not a form of anti-Semitism? Well, I believe it is. But I also believe, as I said, that it's a form of anti-Semitism of which the people who, who carry it are entirely unaware. And it's, it's amazing, actually. I remember my dad, when, when he was still alive, he asked me about one of these guys... It was actually Sue Blackwell. Um, so tell me, David, you know, in private, is she an anti-Semite? And I said, I said, no, not at all. You know, she's honestly a person who considers herself to be an opponent of anti-Semitism. And then I said, but, but she is, throughout her whole life, in a war with the Jews. <laughs> she finds herself in a war with Jews, and it seems to me that, that as Robert Fine used to say, if you... If you, um, what is it, Pascal said, first kneel and then pray. So if you find yourself in a battle with the Jewish community, then you might adopt some kind of hostility. So it's almost as if you're saying there are people, I mean, well, if you're not saying it, I will say it, because I think it's true. There are people who can, it's like people who can carry a virus without themselves being made ill by it. You, you can carry within yourself, you can mm. carry and, and further anti-Semitism without yourself being an anti-Semite. Absolutely. I think it's a huge problem. I mean, we've seen, so a lot of people's critique of Jeremy Corbyn was that he can never get us elected. Yep, he's a loser, he's not... Suddenly, people have lost that critique. Suddenly, oh, look, he's a winner. And now, lots of the, the critique has kind of disappeared, yes? But the critique is still there. But they're and on this. As a member of the Labour Party, aren't you, aren't you abashed by the sight of so many of his critics suddenly on their back, like dogs before a bigger dog, showing their bellies? Is that not... Yes, if I knew what abashed was, I would be abashed. Um, what I was going to so, uh, I wrote the other day in the Jewish Chronicle, and I wrote, so, in the Jewish Chronicle for mainly a Jewish audience, and I, said, I started, because one of the things we have to do in my writing, in my journalism, in my academic work, I always have to start by proving that there is anti-Semitism on the left, and providing, you know, a hundred examples before I'm allowed to go on and try and analyze it, which is kind of infuriating. So I tried not to do that this time. And I said, people reading this, if they don't know yet that Jeremy Corbyn has had a career um, relationship to anti-Semitic politics, then they don't want to know. And a very good old comrade of mine got in touch with me and she said, this is not true. She said, there's 13 million people voted Labour and most of them don't have the faintest idea about the issue of anti-Semitism with regard to labor. And I, I thought this was interesting because I took it seriously. And then I said, I, I wrote back to her actually, and I said, but whose job is it? How do people know things, right? How would people know that Corbyn has had this decades long association with boycott and with anti-Zionist anti politics and jumping to the defense of anti-Semites? Anti How would people know? And the way people would know is through journalism, and through activists, and through intellectuals. And there's a problem there, which is that the, journal the journalists and the activists and the intellectuals haven't been interested in or able to communicate that message. And it's odd, isn't it? Because we, you and me, have been shouting it. You know, every week, like mad people, oh, look, Jacobson and Hirsch off again, talking about anti-Semitism. It's all they ever talk about. It's all they care about. It's, you know, again, into the anti-Semitic narrative. But it's true that many, many people, you know, people love what Corbyn said the other day on the stage. They love that he said people shouldn't be homeless. They love that they said people should have food to eat. Yep. They love, you know, that we're all black and white and gay and straight and, and from all nations and, and, and all people like the message. And I remember 
when I was 17 years old, I remember watching Ken Livingston on the stage at the GLC gigs. Who was there with me? Who was at the Smiths at the Dam? Some of you were there. And we loved it. I loved it. I loved watching Ken Livingston. So then I'm worried that now I'm kind of the old fart who's yep. saying, oh, yep. well, all these young people today, yep. they know nothing. Yep. But then what's one to do? I mean, I'm just writing a piece now about Corbyn and the, amnes the amnesic young. There was, a, there was a, a, a piece in The Guardian or The New Statesman quite recently from a young woman saying, look, what you have, why, I love, why I love Corbyn and why you can't persuade me not to. And what she was saying is there's no point. It, was, uh, it wasn't aggressive. She was saying there's no point in your telling me that, you know, he used to appear with Jerry Adams. I don't know who Jerry Adams is. Now, that's Jerry Adams. That's before we get to Hamas and Hezbollah. So what does one do about this? Was that if one's now dealing with, with a whole amnesic generation who do not get their information from the channels we used yes. to get our information from, but here I'm... we have, good or bad, whatever one thinks of Jeremy Corbyn or the next leader, if, they are, if we have a generation of, mm. of kids who have now got the vote, am I the only person who suddenly thinks, I liked, I liked the young when they were not interested in voting? But, well, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> I'm really worried about this, though, because I'm really worried about sort of demonizing the person I was when I was 17. And I, you know, I was one of these guys. And, and I, we, the, the last thing we want to do, so with the Brexit referendum, we said it was the old farts that got us into this trouble. And now we're saying it's the thick, young, you know, the stupid young kids who don't know nothing getting us into this. And I, I'm worried about about always, a, and, and actually we see that more and more with anti-Semitism, that people are sort of saying it's over there. So the right sees it on the left, the left sees it on the right, Donald Trump sees it in the Democratic Party, the Democrats see it in Trump, yep. and, and, and I think we, I'm worried about that. And are you, are you worried enough to feel, well let me put this another way, there is reason to believe now, is there not, that we might very well have a Labour government by the end of the year. That's not at all out of the question, it's whether possible. we want it or we, or we don't. And whatever we, felt, whatever we felt before, we can certainly see that Labour has made a better argument mm. for itself to be in government than May's people are doing. There's no, whatever, you, whatever else you feel, that is, that, well, that for me anyway would be the case. But that leads one then to be concerned. Do you think, do you think there is a possibility that Corbyn can, can Corbyn be, well, we, we were always told that Corbyn was this most sincere person who only, you know, stood for what... We now know that Corbyn is actually, for good or bad, much more versatile than that. Do you think it could, do you think it could come within the compass of his versatility to face the fact that he actually needs a few more votes from Jews in one or two key seats that he got? Could he be persuaded, if only politically, to think again about his attitudes, to, maybe to talk to some? Well, I'd like to actually... Um... To talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to do some empirical work on this, actually, because we don't know. We don't know if lots of people are, if more people are attracted to Labour for its radicalism and its hostility to Israel and its hostility to, to everything that the grown-ups say one shouldn't be hostile to. We don't know if it's gaining more votes or losing votes. Is anti-Semitism in the Labour Party quite exciting? Is it quite popular? Or is it something that people... Um, are put off by. And the, the, the two must both be true, but we don't know. But if you're right about half of that, that's more terrible. It had never occurred to me that anti-Semitism could be a vote winner in, in the, in the, in the okay. Labour Party. Call me naive, but anti-Zionism anti 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 could, could be a vote winner in the Labour Party. I think the, the radicalism of standing up against what the grown-ups say, the uh, radicalism uh. of... of, of um, I think that a lot of this has become a kind, of, a kind of rite of passage. That there's a community which used to be actually very small on the left. It used to be a very small part of the left. And it is that small part of the left is getting bigger and bigger and is actually partly in the leadership of the party. And in order to be part of that milieu, you have to say certain things about Israel and you have to say certain things about anti-Semitism. And what you have to say is you have to be kind of fundamentally wholly critical of Israel um, in a kind of, in various ways which, which, are, which go beyond rational criticism. And you have to recognize people who talk about anti-Semitism, in other words, this whole audience, as being the enemy, as being outside of the boundary of legitimate discourse. So we have to find, a, one of the things we have to do is find a way of speaking if it's possible, that makes us not outside of that discourse.
Yes. And it might be that we need to look to ourselves in the way we make, and the way we talk about this. Ourselves could be a problem. But that's a big one. Don't you? I, can hear, I feel murmuring in the audience. Yep. Um, and it could be that it's time, therefore, to, to have questions. And you just have to rely on either one of us to kind of just pick you, and that's the... You okay. pick one. Um, let's begin with um, the person there and the person down here at the front. Have we got a roving mic? <clears throat> yes, we have. When I watch uh, Corbyn, <laughs> when I watch Corbyn campaigning uh, his second time for leadership, he was so. Uh, and then you have Owen Smith on the other side. Owen There's Smith, a microphone coming. To seize it. Owen Smith was completely, utterly against anti-Semitism. He was very vocal about it very direct about it, and he condemned it. Corbyn, sadly, during that campaign, found the same tone as Owen Smith. He realized his electioneering be behind him. I think Corbyn is anti-Semitic, he's devious, and he's utterly, uh, he has a contempt for anything, anything to do with Israel, Jewish, and, and he structurally cannot stand the idea that, that, uh, that Israel exists. He would say, wouldn't he, that, he, that, that you're not right. He would say, um, you're right about Israel, but you're not right about, you're not right about the Jews. He if, you, if you compare <coughs> the first time with Sel, uh, Selma Milne, when Selma Milne uh, advised him how to address the whole issue, is anti-Semitism and all racism. When Owen Smith said it's all about anti-Semitism, uh, oh. Corbyn agreed with him because he realized, oh, maybe I'm on the wrong side here. It was just a facade. Well, I mean, we, we then have to decide how far that matters. Do we need, I mean, if, if Corbyn is going to be our prime minister, do we need him to be completely re-educated? on this question, or would it do, or would it do that he simply knows that he just has to tone down some of his own passions and prejudices? Would that do? Yes. I mean, not yes to you, yes to yeah. you. In my opinion, it wouldn't do at all. A man who's been insulting Israel and the Jews for 35 years can't change his opinion suddenly. To see... <laughs> to read the headline in the Jewish Chronicle a week or two ago saying, let's give Corbyn a chance, made me feel sick to my stomach, actually. Yeah, yeah, me too. It's, it's too incredible. Yeah. If a man has been insulting you for 35 years, it's enough for me. I believe he's an anti-Semite. He's always going to be an anti-Semite, and nothing is going to stop him from being All right, so here he is, and he's prime minister by December. Now what are you going to do? Leave the country. I don't think a Jew is safe here in this country if Corbyn is the prime minister of this country. So I can, 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 can I, do you mind if I just push this? What do you think, what do you think, is, what do you think would then follow? What would you fear that would follow? Well, I do you think there are going to be pogroms? I don't think there'll be pogroms, but there'll be more and more attacks on Jews, and Jews will get more and more afraid to open their mouths and defend themselves. They're a bit afraid now when we're not defending ourselves enough, and we don't go out on the attack enough. I was running Labour Friends of Israel for 15 years until about 25 years ago, and my late husband was the chief whip of the Parliamentary Labour Party, and in our own constituency it was terrible anti-Semitism. Half the times when I'd go to my own committee meeting, of which I was the secretary, they would come out with anti-Semitic posters and things, and I would say, unless you withdraw this and apologise, I'm going to the newspapers and say what lousy anti-Semites you are. There were enough then, and there are many more now. Okay. And we, we should defend ourselves as much as possible right now. I want to give lots of people a chance to speak. Are you coming back? Can we have the mic? Uh, yes. Do, do, right in the middle, here. We're not addressing, I don't know if it's working, we're not addressing the we're not addressing the fact that it's actually a vote winner. That's what bothers me. Let's be honest. Is it a vote winner, Howard? Come on, be honest. Howard. I don't know. I don't know if it's a vote winner. Particularly up north, come on. 
Can you pass the microphone that way, please? Um, the, w I think what we have seen in the last election is that all sorts of things are going on um, that some people are very excited by the kind of naughtiness of Jeremy Corbyn. Other people are interested in feeding, the, feeding and housing the poor in the NHS. Other people um, wanted to vote Labour in spite of Jeremy Corbyn. Other people wanted to vote because of Jeremy Corbyn. But lots and lots of people wanted to vote Labour because they didn't want Theresa May coming along and implementing her immediate Brexit. So I think it seems to me that when we're talking about um, how did we vote in the election? I think we have to understand that there are two choices. And it's possible that the virus of populism is not simply a virus which is on the left, but it's a virus which we've seen um, in other places in British politics. It's utterly confused. It's utterly confused, isn't it? In that the young who, were, who, who are complaining that the, the, about Brexit and want to remain are making a hero of, of Corbyn, who really, is their, who really is their enemy. If anybody could have made remain happen, well, no, possibly. Yeah. He could have done a lot more to make remain happen than he did. I will never forget it. I'll never forget him being asked where he stood on the issue and go, out of ten, what do you think about Remain? He went, mm, mm, seven, well, it's a start seven, six, seven percent. <laughs> how many millions of Labour votes was that worth? So how come, if there's any sense mm. in this sweep of populism, how come they're now making a hero of the very person who deprived them of the thing that they most want? It makes no sense, does it? But the, but, but, but this question of it's a vote winner, where is it? What's the pop concert he's just been talking about? Glastonbury. Thank you. Glastonbury. Do we suppose, do we? I thought that was something in, in Tennysonian myth. The, the Beatles, my People love. sing there, do they? Do we, I, I, don't, I do, of course do not stand as any kind of defender of Corbyn at all. You've heard what I have to say. But do we actually think, given what you've just said, do we actually think that had he stood there and said, I'm mm. against the Jews, that when they were all singing, oh, Jeremy Corbyn, had he sung, oh, I hate the Jews, that they all have gone, oh, we all hate the Jews. Do you think that? <laughs> well, what's, what's, excuse, what's, what is, what is noticeable, what is noticeable is that many, um, Brexiters in the North voted Labour and many Remainers in London voted Labour. So this is a very strange um, thing going on at the moment. Can, can I ask you to speak? Okay, I, I have two questions based just on my own experience of talking at my local Labour Party. Um, in the run-up to the report, I went, my brother wrote a very good speech for me, and another woman went, also Jewish. She spoke much more from the heart, and she cried. She was very much more momentum, much more hard left than I am, and she cried about the anti-Semitism. And the men in the room looked at her, and, and you could see they were moved by a woman crying, but then also disturbed by a Jew speaking. And they didn't know what to do with her. So the two responses were, you must understand that we have to do what we have to do, more or less, because it is a vote winner. And please don't cry, you're upsetting us. <laughs> now, as a woman, I don't know what to do with this. I, 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 I like my local MP, Tulip. I think she does as yeah. good a job as she can under the circumstances. Yeah. I continue to vote Labour but I also continue to cross the street when I see my local Labour uh, uh, canvassers. Hmm. And I don't know what to do. They scare me. On a personal level, as a woman, they scare me. Thank you. And I do not know what to do. So my question is, as a woman living in Kilburn, who crosses the street to avoid her Labour Party, but can only ever hope for a Labour government, what do I do? Can you, can you, can you... Will you take the microphone up to the back, please? A few rows from the back, lady in the white. Um, uh, over here. Okay, so I'm me. Um, no, not you. No, no, oh, are you selling your speech? <laughs> Um, hi, uh, as an American Jew, I'm going to film a stereotype here and be loud. Um, I live in North Islington, so Jeremy Corbyn has to care about my vote, my husband's vote, and I want to use that position to pressure him about this issue. If you were me and have an opportunity to speak with him, what should I be asking him? Is there an ask of the Jewish community, or what can I be doing personally to pressure him since I'm in his constituency? 
Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, look, one thing I want to say to this audience is that you do understand, don't you, that if kind of ordinary people, you know, most of the 12 and a half out of the 13 million Labour voters came in this room, they wouldn't understand what everyone in this room was so upset about. So what we would do is we'd show them a film. We'd show them what we were upset about, and they'd watch it, and they still wouldn't understand what the people in this room were upset about. It's in a kind of extraordinary um, um, thing. I, I want to say one other thing. I want to say that, I, that there was an... Ext I mean, there, there's the Jewish community. Well, there isn't really the Jewish community, but there's no, something that people kind of feel is the Jewish community. And there's also a kind of labor-left community. And these two things kind of colliding at the moment. And there's a huge amount of hostility around. So I'm getting denounced by one side as a liberal and by the other side as a neoliberal. Um, and it's, it's quite, there's, a, there's a lot of hostility around. And I'd, actually, I'd quite like to burst a little bubble. I'd like some of the people in this room who are really cross with the Labour Party and with people, Jews, who supported the Labour Party to articulate that. And I'd like to, to think about, um, you know, on the one hand, people saying, well, we hated Theresa May and her Brexit and her kind of hard austerity. And on the other hand, people saying, well, I can't understand how any Jew could vote for Corbyn. Does anybody want to make that point better than I can? Yes. Yes. Uh, not, not you, Dave. <laughs> yeah, hi. hi. So I, I would like to articulate that. So from my perspective, if I look at the history of the UK post-war, the divide between the right and the left has basically been how you divide the cake up. You know, who, who gets the money? You know, do, do the middle classes get a bit more money or a bit less, or do the working classes get a bit more and a bit less? And that's a real point, and, you know, the thing in the Tower, you know, last week illustrates that that is a real concern in our society. But the difference that many Jews feel, including myself in this election, is that the Labour Party under Corbyn represents something which frankly has echoes of past anti-Semitism. And you've meant, you know, that was mentioned in the film, you've mentioned it again tonight. And so I was, and I'll, I'll freely admit I'm a conservative voter, but to me this goes beyond simply how one divides the cake. This is an issue around what is the status of the Jewish community in this country. Now, there are lots of things you didn't mention in the video tonight, and I'd just like to mention one or two of those things. So when Senior people in the Labour Party say, why should we give money to Jewish synagogues and schools for protection when there's an anti-Semitism issue arising because there's been a conflict in the Middle East? You know, that goes to the safety of our kids in schools. That goes to the safety of ourselves when we go to synagogues. Now, I don't pretend that that's an exclusively Jewish issue, I mean, the thing in Finsbury Park illustrates that there are other ethnic communities who also have to worry about their safety. But nonetheless, you know, as a Jewish father who has kids in a Jewish school, I read things about senior members of the Labour Party saying things like that. It's not just about a Jew's afraid to speak. Okay. There, this goes to the very heart of our community. And that's why, although, you know, I'm concerned about the Labour Party, that's why I'm very concerned that Jews can say... I can support the Labour Party, even with Corbyn as, you know, with Corbyn as its leader. Okay. That's I'd like to ask one or two other people. And, of course, you know, Tories vote Tory, and Tories don't like it when people vote Labour. I understand that. So uh, I'd like a couple of people to make that point. And actually, especially if there's somebody who's a Labour Party person who this time has said, I can't vote Labour anymore, I think that might be you. <laughs> Just a minute, wait for the mic. Um, I'm, I'm not Jewish, um, I, I'm a Zionist. Um, I've always voted Labour, been a Labour Party member, blah, 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 joined the JLM. I voted Tory. I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. OK, anyone else? Because in a minute, there are four, three, three and a half Labour MPs, Jeremy Newmark, half a Labour MP, um, who, who I'm going to ask to come back and to answer the question, why should we do that? Yes, this is my cousin, so he has some kind of special access. Yes, David. I voted, I voted Labour. I did not vote for Corbyn. I voted Labour. Okay. I, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask. 
I'm going to ask people to come back on this point, but I want the point to be made. Is there anyone else who, yes, in the middle? Oh, no? Anyone else? Yes, I want people to tell us. Okay. Dave. Is this another of your cousins? You know all their names. <laughs> Do I have a cousin in the audience? That... Probably. <laughs> Howard, if you just say yes, Dave, you'll be all right. <laughs> Is that a Labour thing? You call everybody Dave? Is that like comrade? <laughs> Good day, Dave. Thank you, Dave and Dave. Um, <laughs> so, has look, the election result, I think it's changed an awful lot. Before the election, you know, when, when uh, the Tories had a 20-point lead over Labour in the polls, it was possible to buy the argument, I'm voting for my local Labour candidate, Labour are going to get a kicking, and if my candidate wins, he'll fight anti-Semitism in the party after the election. That logic no longer applies, because Corbyn's not going anywhere. Okay. Corbyn's not going anywhere, and you know we've had we've seen some okay. brilliant fighters okay. within the party. Are they still going to fight? I think we get the point. I'd like to invite um, any of the Labour MPs here, John or Joan Ryan or Louis Elman or Jeremy Newmark, to tell us why we should vote Labour and why we should be a member of the Labour Party. Yes, correct. He's not an MP. I do understand that. Louise, do you want to speak, Jeremy? Oh, sorry, Louise. My cousin Louise. <laughs> just just as, I, as I pass the microphone over, of course there's a lot of people here who aren't going to agree with what's been said, and we'll just give the courtesy of listening. Thank you. Right, thank you. Well, the, the reason for the, the recent increased support for the Labour Party is because the Labour Party is seen correctly as the way to get better economic and social justice. That's the reason. But there is no doubt whatsoever that what is happening in relation to anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is a great stain and a shame on the Labour Party. And, but saying one of those things does not eliminate the other. But there are many people in the Labour Party, MPs and people out who are not MPs, who are fighting what is happening, who, who, who are disgusted and appalled in what is happening. Now, you might not see it, but there is some small, but not enough, progress being made in that there is a disciplinary procedure in the Labour Party, and now slowly, much too slowly, some action is being taken against some people. Not against Ken Livingstone, as I'm sure somebody will shout out, not against some other high-profile people, but it is being taken against some. And the source of a lot of the problem is to do with the intense anti-Zionism of a lot of the left in the Labour Party, not all of the left, a lot of the left in the Labour Party who see anti-Zionism, who see Zionism through a prism of imperialism and associated racism. That is where it is actually coming from. Yep. So the people who are making their comments coming from that, some of them really do not get it and don't understand when we're talking about anti-Semitism. However, that does not explain or excuse the people who then talk about Zionist power, influence over America, and all of those anti-Semitic tropes. All the comments of people like Jackie Walker, who talk about um, Jews controlling the slave trade and associated comments. But, but that is the, the other thing is that the basis, the interpretation of Zionism, is the base of a lot of it. I don't say that to excuse a thing. I think it's appalling. I am fighting it hard, and I've made complaints about my local Labour Party in relation to this. And action has been taken. It is not completed yet, but something is being done. I'm still fighting it. And so are the people who are around me. And, and Joan Ryan is with me tonight. It is one of them. Jeremy Newmar, who chairs Jewish Labour Movement, is fighting it very, very hard as an associated body. So there are good people, and a lot of them, and they're not all Jewish. In fact, most of them aren't Jewish, who are appalled at what is going on. So I just say to people, remember, that is there as well. And we need support to carry on our fight. Mm -hmm. But Thank what you, happens, Louise. but Louise, can I just ask you, what happens? You're in power, you're in power next year, and we're, pl we're pleased that you're in power. We're anxious about others that you've just described. And there is another, uh, there's another outbreak of violence in the Middle East. There's another Gaza war, for example. 
What's going to happen then? Where are, because whatever you say about the people fighting, Corbyn will still be Corbyn and the influences anyway on Corbyn will still be there. What on earth will happen if we get another of those outbreaks of kind of intellectual and press anti-Semitism that we had the last time in Gaza? Where, what will the Labour Party, how will the Labour Party douse that or contribute to that then? I want to say that for most of the people involved in making the film, the film was made actually with love for the Labour Party. Um, Jeremy, do you want to say something? Oh, sorry, Joan. One, Joan first, Jeremy, and second. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Joan Ryan. I'm chair of Labour Friends of Israel. Um, I came. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I, um, I came more to listen than um, to 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 say anything else, but I thought the film was very powerful. Um, I think, um, <laughs> in terms of the Labour Party. There's a, there's a number of reasons I think it's important for us to um, stand up to this and be part of the Labour Party. First of all, um, I think it's something Mr Power said about why oh. we're in the Labour Party, um, about justice and equality and fairness. And I think that's part of what attracts young people to the Labour Party. I don't believe um, that anti-Semitism is attractive as an electioneering ploy. And I don't believe that's what makes young people want to vote Labour. I think they don't see that. What they see is the idea of fairness and equality. And they are idealistic. And I think a huge number of the people who join the Labour Party, who we call Corbynistas, are not anti-Semitic and what they believe is they want some hope. They want, um, they're idealistic and they want an end to austerity and they want to see a future um, that they can believe in. So I think that's why a lot of people join. I think the reason we've got to stay put and make the argument, and, a, and I don't give this as a responsibility to the Jewish community. I'm not Jewish, and I take responsibility for this. And I think many more people who are not Jewish need to do that as well. But we do need to do it together. Because to abandon the ground doesn't mean the problem goes away. It means it grows because we leave the stage They've got it all to themselves. That's not good. That's almost like saying you can have it. We don't want, of the two main political parties in this country, that one of them should be, uh, be allowed to become anti-Israel and one pro-Israel. I think that would be a very serious situation to get in. I'm not willing at this point to walk away from the Labour Party that I believe in the values and principles of because it has not done all it should have done about anti-Semitism. And I believe the Chakrabarti report was at the very best a missed opportunity. We wanted to see in that report the clear lines drawn where criticism of Israel becomes anti-Semitic. And Thanks, we Joan. did not get that. We were totally disappointed with that. Thank you, Joan. And it was made worse that she did accept a peerage in such proximity <sighs> to that report, could not but call it into question. And I think that was a very wrong thing for her to do and for it to be offered at that point, but I'm not willing to give this ground. I am willing to stand and fight. I don't care about how much Twitter abuse or anything else I get, because I didn't join the Labour Party to keep my head down when it most mattered and do the wrong thing. I joined it to stand up for what I believe in. I'm willing to do that, but we certainly need some of you to do it with us. Thank you. Can I just ask, can we, can I just ask you one thing, though? I mean, I think that's all fantastic and, and what one wants to hear, but one also wants to know whether you're getting anywhere. 
Um, are you, are you, are yes, you, are you making any are. difference? Yeah. Because yeah. just one thing, yeah. when yeah. you talk about youthful hopefulness and idealism, isn't part of the problem that enmeshes anti-Zionism in the Labour Party, that it is part of that Zionism, it is part of, it is part of that idealism to believe that Zionism is an evil, and that one of the things, among the things that the youth hope for is the end of Zionism, and for some of them, the end of Israel. How are you going to take that away from the idealism that you admire so much? Well, I don't think they come in to the party on the basis that they want their anti-Zionists or their anti-Semitic. No. So I, I think you've always got to be there taking responsibility and making the arguments, not just in the Labour Party. There are other places that clearly needs to happen. But the Labour Party is expected to give leadership on these things. And it is more wrong for Labour in a way than anyone else because of what we say are our values and principles. I understand that. But I think if we walk away, then we leave young people who okay. want to have that hope to think that it's right to be anti-Zionist. And I agree with what Louise said. I don't want to repeat it, but I do think that hard left politics since the 70s have been characterized by this anti-Zionist, uh, anti-Semitic um, you know, politics. Yep. If we don't take it on within and outside of the Labour Party, we let it grow. And mm. I, I, I also think that it should have just focused the Chakrabhaj report on anti-Semitism. I think that's right because that's what the problem was and is at the time. It wasn't all the other forms of racism, though I agree anti-Semitism is a form of racism. And I think it was very wrong that it wasn't just focused on I the problem. Was, yeah. And I think one thing that we have seen from this, from this situation... <laughs> sorry, sorry, I passed the mic. Thank you, thank you Joan Ryan. Um, right now, we're running out of time, but right now we're hearing from the people who are leading the fight within the Labour Party against anti-Semitism. I'd like to hear from uh, Jeremy Newmark, and then I'd like to hear more from Howard. Um, we're running out of time. David, um, look, for me, it's, uh, it's very simple, and I'll, I'll, I'll be very brief. Um, you know, my politics are rooted in the politics of anti-racism. I grew up fighting the BNP and the National Front on the streets of London in the uh, late 80s and the early 90s. And I went through those fights against anti-Semites on the left in the trade union movement, in the uh, academic sector, in the AUT and, and the UCU with you and, and other comrades. And I think one of the lessons that I took away from those experiences is that if you walk away and if you leave a vacuum, it just gets worse. You know, last year we commemorated the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Cable Street, perhaps one of the most seminal moments of uh, left-wing Jews standing together with other anti-racist trade unionists and, and some of those founders of the Labour Party as we know it today. Uh, and the message of Cable Street wasn't that we run away and we vacate the space. It was that we stay, we stand, and, and we fight. And I think that's what motivates me and many others, certainly around the, uh, the Jewish labor movement, not to run away, to stand fast and to keep fighting in this space. I think the second reason is that we have some wonderful friends in the party. The Labour Party has never been owned by one individual. It's never been owned by its leader, mm. and it's not a party that even today is owned by Jeremy Corbyn. We have democratic structures, we have a national executive committee, we have a parliamentary Labour Party that contains some of the absolute heroes we've heard from this evening, like Joan, like Louise, like John Mann, people like Ruth Smith, Luciana Berger, Tom Watson, John Speller, and many, many others that have taken on this fight at great personal cost, at costs that have in many cases never been put into the public domain. And I think we have a responsibility, not as the victims and the targets, to own the problem and solve it ourselves, but I do think we have a responsibility to stand side by side with those heroes, with those allies, in the parliamentary party and in the democratic structures of the Labour Party to work with them. And I think my final point is about one individual. It's the story of Naz Shah, who I sat down with just over a year ago and talked her through Zionism, 
Israel, the Jewish National Liberation Movement, and explain to her, in almost student politics terms, what this was really about. And she saw her mistake, she saw her error straight away, and she said to me, you know what? Nobody from within a labor context or a labor perspective has ever said it to me like that. I understand it now. She apologized, and she's become somebody absolutely at the vanguard of fighting this problem and become a beacon for tolerance, and it's because of the Thanks, story Jeremy. of Naz and people like her Thank that we you, stay, Jeremy. we stand, and we fight. I, we're really running out of time. I want to ask Howard, I want to ask Howard if you believe that the NHS is hugely underfunded, if you believe that austerity is, is really biting into people's living standards, if you believe in a basic social democratic message, who should you vote for? No, that's not what I do. This is not, this is not what I'm for. What, what I do is I dither. My job, I, my job is to dither. My job is to present the confusion that I'm in and in that way be a kind of spokesperson for everybody else's confusion. There is nothing... I try and go on holiday when there's an election. I actually, I actually voted this time... Uh, I'll tell you who I voted for. I voted for the Liberal Democrats, although it, there was no point in doing it, but for the simple reason that I wanted to make a token, token anti-Brexit. Though, because that also occupies my time at the moment. The reason I'm, the, what makes me a problem here, you, you hopeful and me not, is I am extremely despondent about life for Jews because I think we are, I think philosophically, we are a problem for everybody. We are the eternal other. Nobody does it better than us. We are fantastic <laughs> about being the other. And we do it so well that we even have numerous Jew, numerous of our, many, many Jews that I know for them too, the Jew, the Jew is the other. Nobody dislikes a Jew better than a Jew dislikes a Jew. There is a, there is a, there is a, there is a problem here. So, or, I mean, I, I can, but there's no use in my preaching despondency to you. You want to hear something else. So, if our problem at the moment is the Labour Party, then one wants to hear from Jeremy and from you about what you could do. Do then convince me by doing to mm. Jer Jeremy Corbyn what you've done to Naz Shah. <laughs> and that's when I'm feeling. <laughs> I, I want to say, say we're really running out of time and there's a hundred people with their hands up and I'm not going to come to them, but I am going to come to one person with his hand up in this room because he's absolutely earned the right. John Mann. With respect, uh, David, it's the wrong question. I'm happy to come back and debate who we should vote for, and there won't be an election this year, but it's the wrong question. And uh, as I predicted coming in, despondency would take over by the end. <laughs> and, uh, and you're wrong to be despondent. You're very wrong to be despondent. Right to be wary, right to be on alert, a right to be organised, and I, I'd like to congratulate Judith. Organising. <laughs> Tom York of Radiohead led the Jeremy Corbyn chant on the pyramid stage at Glastonbury. On his way to his landmark conference, uh, landmark performance in Israel. Yay. And nobody but nobody at Glastonbury attacked him, criticised him, or challenged him from that in the audience, despite the efforts of the Palestinian Solidarity Campaign. They couldn't get, they couldn't get what they wanted from that audience. And that is worth bearing in mind. During the general election, the National Union students moved from being run by a group of people who are best described as anti-Semites to be run by a group of people who are best described as being friends of the Jewish community. During the general election, the Labour Student Organisation 
allegedly about to fall in the hands of Momentum and their friends, unanimously voted in people, strongly supportive of Jewish students of the State of Israel, that's the Labour students, two weeks before the general election. Last week, last week, Oxford University Labour Club, which has had some of the biggest problems in the last few years, repeated its support of early this year for the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism, as proposed by my daughter, by voting out the entire momentum leadership of that Labour club. And the reason is because my daughter took her friends along and they all voted. And that's why, and that was last week. And so my message to you is, do what Judith's been doing. Organise. Organise. Frankly, there aren't enough Jews in this country to make that much difference in general elections. A handful of seats. A handful of seats. And you can identify which seats would have gone Labour, but for the Jewish vote, which didn't. But frankly, that is not going to be the power of the Jewish community. The power of the Jewish community is the woman from Islington North who said, what do I say to Jeremy Corbyn? What you say is you go find Corbyn because he's your MP and you ask him, why, if I'm a Jewish person, have you not expelled Livingstone from the Labour Party yet? <laughs> you ask him why, there's a man who says he spent his entire life dedicated to anti-racism. He's not prepared to make a speech exclusively, explicitly, just on anti-Semitism to outline why it is the worst of racisms and why anyone, anyone who is an anti-Semite should be called by him, the Labour Party and everybody else, a racist. That's what you should be asking Corbyn. And let me tell you, we're going nowhere. We're going nowhere. I learned about the Jewish community from my family. And let me, if I just abuse my position, just to explain, because they always get asked, oh, why, do you all, why do you do all this stuff? Uh, the answer's because I'm an MP, and I'm elected to do it, and not because I have any votes in my constituency. Um, but, other than my Liberal Democrat opponent, who was Jewish, no, was Jewish, is Jewish, you have to ask him, he's now a Quaker, used to be in the IDF. <laughs> I'm not going to make a party political point and point out the confusion of Liberal Democrats now. But, 1902 in Leeds was the height of the Jewish Taylors Trade Union. And it got broken by the employers, but it didn't wither on the vine. And when the engineering workers went on strike and formed the Labour Party in 1906, because my grandfather was one of those on strike who formed it. And he had no work for three years because of it. And my grandmother had to leave school age 14, having got a scholarship, never to continue her education in her entire life. And those Jewish workers stood with my family. And it was never written up. And Jeremy Newmark mentioned Cable Street. Cable Street was written up because it's in London, and there's lots of academics in London in 1936. <laughs> but the Battle of Holbeck Moor was never written up. But the Battle of Holbeck Moor was bigger than Cable Street. It was two weeks before. Now, if you know Leeds, you know where Holbeck Moor is. My family lived on the street next to Holbeck Moor their entire lives. My grandfather was the court butcher on the shop on the corner of Holbeck Moor. When in 1936, with no press, no historian writing it up, those Jewish workers and their families, and those trade unionists and their families, stopped Mosley and the fascists from marching, People in London 
took inspiration two weeks later and did the same thing. Never written at once, but what was that? It was organisation. But it was also being prepared to speak out for what is right. And that's why we're going nowhere. This is my party, not Corbyn's party. This is my party. We are going nowhere because we will play our role. We will play our role in combating anti-Semitism until mm -hmm. we wipe it out of our party. John, we're being... I hope it'll take, I hope it'll take minutes. I suspect it'll take longer. But we are going nowhere. We are not going to be giving up. Whenever an anti-Semite stands up, they will be challenged. They will be challenged, hopefully eloquently, but forcibly. And what we'd say to you is, give us your support when we do so. And do not be conned into thinking that our party, our country, any part of it, is ever going to hand over itself to the anti-Semites. Because we will beat them as we've beaten them before. And therefore, my message is don't be despondent. Be organised. Be active. Thanks, John.